Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we're talking to a lecturer and assistant professor in Russian and post-Soviet politics at the University of Bath, Dr. Stephen Hall. Welcome, Dr. Hall. It's really good to have you on Frontline today. And Thank we're, you much, Kate. we're talking in the event of Russia accusing Ukraine of launching its biggest ever drone attack on Moscow. Can you just mm. explain your understanding of what's happened? Well, there's so many uh, possibilities as to what's actually happened, and uh, I don't want to speculate, but from what we've seen, there has been early this morning um, a large drone attack on Moscow. The Russian Ministry of Defence has said that it was eight drones. Uh, I've seen other reports that put up over 30, so we simply don't know the exact number. Um, and three buildings have been damaged, probably by possibly by air defence or the drones being shot down and hitting these buildings. And certainly, I think that there has been, you know, it's been particularly interesting as to where a lot of these drones have tried to hit, which is Rublovka, which is where the Russian political elite live. A lot of, it's an area outside Moscow, uh, a set of villages on the highway, and that is where a lot of these uh, people in the Russian political and business elites have their homes. So I think that's particularly fascinating. Politicians and military mm. representatives in Kyiv deny that Ukraine has anything to do with this. Do you think it's possible it has? Well, I mean, there, 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 there is a strong possibility that it does. We know that um, the Ukrainians do have the capacity to get drones, get drones to Moscow. I think it's very unlikely that we're seeing a drone coming all the way from Kiev or the Ukrainian border. We're talking an 800 kilometer distance. I would like to think that any country would be able to take out a drone that was coming that far into its own territory. We know that the Russian military has had problems in the past, but it's a huge undertaking to get a number of drones all that way without the Russians seeing them. Um, it's possible in terms of the fact that the SVU, the security services in Ukraine, they did this in the past. They had certain shell companies. Remember the Kirsch Bridge in Crimea? They set up shell companies and bought the, or hired the truck through these shell companies with the explosives and managed to get it from one part of Russia to Crimea. And then they detonated it on the bridge. So it's quite possible that the SBU has bought itself a factory outside Moscow uh, where they are actually constructing or re constructing these drones and then flying them into Moscow from it's there. So that could be a plausible, plausible possibility. Do you think that's the most likely possibility? Well, there are, other, there are other possibilities as well. It could be if we believe that there are Russian partisans, we've seen certainly that some trains have, and uh, relay stations have been destroyed, not trains, but the railway tracks, I mean. Um, it is possible that we could be seeing partisans, but it takes an awful lot uh, of capacity to, to do this. And the FSB, the Russian security services, have generally been quite good at finding people. Uh, they've already found one person, a potential culprit, who was Ukrainian, who may or may not have had links to the SBU, but that still remains to be seen. So I think certainly it is the strongest possibility at the moment, at least, is that it is the Ukrainians in some capacity. But that isn't to say that it is, you know, that. but we still simply don't know. And until more information comes out, we cannot possibly say. Drone attacks inside mm. Russia have intensified in recent weeks. Um, we've seen those two are uh, allegedly on the Kremlin on the 3rd of May, and we've seen attacks yes. on oil pipelines. Is this emerging as part of a pattern now, do you think? I think certainly it is emerging as part of a pattern. And again, the Ukrainians have said before there is a drone army um, and it's in Russia. So it, there is certainly this idea, and I think the Ukrainians are playing on it, that um, there, are, there are people in Russia who do not support Putin, who are willing to risk their lives to, bring, to attack the Russian state. And this creates fear within Russia, certainly within the security services, certainly within the regime, and hopefully forces the Russians to look inwards rather than looking at Ukraine and takes their military back. We've seen this in the case of what happened in Belgorod recently last week as well, the idea of trying to force the Ukra Russians to go back into Belgorod to protect their border, which is far too porous, um, and allowing the Russian Legion and the Free Russia Corps to get into Belgorod. Um, so I think certainly 
there is that there, that is the potential to try and to try and create this idea that there is a column a, a pro Ukrainian column pro Western column that is trying to un- destroy the Putin regime, um, and this fits in with the idea that it's partisan. So again, it's entire, it's speculation as to whether it is the partisan whether it is partisan groups or whether it is the Ukrainians themselves. <laughs> That was exactly yeah. what my next question was yeah. going to be. To what extent do you think uh, Ukraine is directly responsible for what's happening in these attacks or is actually coordinating and keeping quiet behind the scenes and it's actually suiting their narrative to let sympathetic groups do the work for them? I think there is certainly this, whether they're actually coordinating it, I don't know. They may be helping supply certain um, information, let's say passing on information, saying where the Russian missile defence systems are, although Russian partisans, if they exist, should know that as well. And we did actually see that one of the drones was trying to take out the strategic missile command centre outside Moscow. So I think that certainly there is going to be a lot of support coming from Kiev for the sharing of intelligence. But that's not the same as saying that Kiev is supplying these organisations or Kiev is Ukrainian forces outside Moscow pound, ready to pounce on uh, any problem, any anything they can find in Moscow. This is very much a game of smoke and mirror, uh, you know, sh- smoke and shadows, shadows and mirrors, what have you. It's in Ukraine is trying to find allies that it can work with. Um, and if at the moment it is my friends, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So if they can find groups within Russia who don't like the regime, they will support those people. As we speak right now, mm. there have been 16 attacks on Kyiv uh, this month. Yes. And General Budinov had said, had intimated that there mm. will be retaliation for the latest. Do you think that's what this is, is what has happened in Moscow? I think there is a, a strong possibility that uh, it is a high, it is to show that they've talked about the drone army before. They've talked about partisans before and they will find ways to get to Moscow. They've talked about the need to show that Kiev is, you know, they will not forgive what's happened in Kiev, that uh, Moscow is not safe. And this also helps to weaken Russia's military resolve, or at least the thinking is in regards to that. Um, So that's, I can certainly understand, I can certainly see the point that, uh, yes, this is... But if it's making uh, Russians feel that Moscow is not safe, this also suits the Russian narrative, doesn't it, that it's under attack by terrorists? It's a, I mean, this is all, again, going back to the speculation of the idea. I've seen plenty of reports already on, on Twitter and tele, Russian Telegram that this is a false flag, that we're back to the conspiracy theory of, the 90, of 1999 and the apartment bombings in Moscow. Uh, Putin is trying to find a way to justify forced mass mobilisation um, and getting a million soldiers back in, you know, into uniform and out to Ukraine as quickly as possible. That is always plausible. One, one when they study Russian politics, becomes incredibly cynical quite early. Um, and so there is a possibility that the, the false flag is, is possible. Um, I tend to believe at the moment that it isn't. We'll see what happens in regards to that. But... Um, there is, it certainly would fit the Russian narrative to a great extent, especially as it was resi- three residential buildings were hit. Um, the Russians have been very quick about uh, not saying what hit them. And also the prosecutor general's office came out today and said they will prosecute anyone who talks about the drones and what happened in Moscow today. You said earlier it was really interesting, the areas that uh, have been allegedly targeted yes. in these attacks. What do you read into that? Well, again, it's the area, the areas of the political and business elite in Russia. Um, so their their houses, their wives, their mistresses, their families, you know, you know even just the people they close uncles and aunts, those sort of thing, people. Um, I think it's particularly interesting as to the fact that it is the elite that has been targeted, that they are trying to um, show that they're not safe, that it's also a way perhaps to show, again, even for the uh, Muscovites, even for the average Russian, it highlights that the government is unable to defend them. Um, and so if you target, if the elites are targeted, then there is also that possibility that there is fear that Putin, this great man, is unable to actually protect the elite. And perhaps it's important, about time that they found someone who could protect them. Um, but again, this is all <laughs> very much, uh, you know, thinking, pie in the sky thinking at the moment.
The Ukrainian presidential advisor, Mikhailo Podialak, has reportedly said that the counteroffensive is already underway and that this is the start of it. It's not going to be like one huge date that it all kicks no. off, but it's going to be a drip, drip, or intimating it's going to be a drip, drip, drip effect. Is that how you see it? Well, I think that's certainly the case um, from what I see. You know, there have been Ukrainian movements around Bucha, um, not in the actual city, but around the periphery of Bucha, pushing the Russians back. That's been going on for a while. And we know from the previous offense, counter-offensive of the Ukrainians around Kherson and Kharkiv Oblast that it was very much a drip-drip effect. Um, and that once the Ukrainian army was slowing down in Kherson, they then tried Kharkiv. And then when the Russians collapsed in Kharkiv, they then moved into Kherson again. So it's a very slow process. It will be, as Podolyak has said in the past, a spiral. They will try one place, they will try another, they will see where the Russians are weakest, and they will try uh, other places as well at various times on multiple fronts to see where the gaps are and where Russia will, is unable to protect its uh, front. So the, I can envisage that this will be a, very, be a relatively slow counteroffensive. I don't think we're going to be talking about the mass movement of troops in one direction very quickly. I think it is very much a almost skirmishing process at the moment. Um, but I'm not a military strategist, uh, so I may be completely wrong about this. <laughs> If it, if it is a skirmishing process, how does that fit into the bigger picture of the war? I think at the moment, it, you know, the bigger picture of the war is that Ukraine is going to be given support by the West, that Ukraine is going to liberate as much of its territory as it can. Russia doesn't, simply does not want to negotiate. We've seen this. Um, so I think both sides are kind of waiting for the counteroffensive and to how effective it's going to be. If Ukraine's counteroffensive does find the gaps and is able to push through, then we'll see a very different picture in the next six months. If it's unable to take that much territory, then that also will change the situation. But I think at the moment, it doesn't matter as to how quick, I don't think anyone is expecting a rapid counteroffensive. I don't think that's possible, judging by the... Um, minefields, judging by the defensive positions the Russians have built. Um, if they're as effective as they look on paper, it's going to take a long time. So I, it's entirely understandable that the Ukrainians are drip feeding the counteroffensive, trying to find weaknesses. I was going to ask you if this is going to be a defining moment um, in the war, but from what you're saying, I think you, you would disagree with that completely and that it is simply just a, a waiting game, would you say? I would love for this to be a, a, a defining moment of the war, and that uh, will be, you know, that I can find, will be able to visit Kiev uh, by December. Um, that Ukraine will win this war, and I still believe Ukraine will. Um, I think at the moment it is a matter of seeing where Russia is weakest, and also building up this, building up the pressure, um, and also hope, hopefully, demoralizing. Russians, the fact that Belgr the Belgorod Oblast has happened, Bryansk before it, Moscow drone attacks, um, continual attacks in Crimea and in various other parts of Russian-occupied Ukraine, illegally occupied Ukraine. Um, so this is a way to demoralize the Russian army. Um, and hopefully this will make it much easier for the Ukrainians to push, out, push the Russians as far back as possible. And hopefully this will lead to a defining moment. But I don't think we're quite there yet. And where do you think Russia will uh, strike next? What do you think the response will be to these drone attacks on Moscow? I think, understandably, there's a, you know, I think that at the moment, all Russia, Russia will continue to fire missiles at places like Kiev, Dnipro, Kherson, Kharkiv, as it's been doing since the beginning of the war. If this is going to be the moment when Russia decides to mobilise, I don't, at the moment, I don't see that being the case. And I could be wrong. And tomorrow we could be talking about the mass mobilization of Russia. But I still believe that most Russians perceive, at least, that this is Putin's war, um, that there would need to be something else. A, a small attacks on three residential buildings, which probably were harmed more from the fact that the drones were shot down and landed where they did, or the missiles also, you know, fragments when they go up in the air tend to come down somewhere. Um, that certainly, I don't think, is going to lead to support for the mass mobilization of the uh, of, of Russians. And I think that that is certainly something that Putin is still worried about, that it is going to be deeply unpopular. 
Um, so I think he needs to find, he would need, I think the regime would need to find something bigger in order to popularize this war and turn it from Putin's war into Russia's war. And what would that be? Well, I mean, <laughs> we simply don't know as to what that would be. Um, but, you know, hypothetically, I can imagine that it would be an apartment, bo apartment block going up or going down, as the case may be, um, and possibly more deaths. Um, at the moment, the hospitalization of two people, as sad as it is, for minor injuries is simply not going to galvanize enough people to want to go out uh, and join the Russian army. This is the problem the regime has had. It's, all, it's had the atomization of Russian society for such a long time that they, can, they, they are very happy to support Putin so long as it's from the comfort of their sofa. Um, so, you know, for the regime to then say, well, actually, we need you to go out on, into the steppes of Ukraine and put down your life for, for, for the regime is, is something I don't think most Russians at the moment are willing to do. Dr. Stephen Hall, really good to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time Thank for you. being on Frontline today. You have been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. My thanks to Louis Sykes, our producer, and to you for watching. Bye bye.